Go educate the life out of kids, set the expectation, tell them they can do whatever they set their mind to, show them how to train for that, show them how to acquire skills, show to them that you can go to any university you want, just make it all day rigor, all the good, powerful things that they could do with their life, just make them assume it is all true. You can do it, even if people hate you and they wanna stop you, you can actually get so good at something that people can't stop you even though they want to. If you took an entire generation and you just embedded that in their psyches, that tears down all the other bullshit. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. I'm really excited about today's episode. I have got on a brilliant guest. I was actually, we just recorded an episode for his podcast yesterday, and I'm actually in his studio right now in Los Angeles. And this is the host of the Impact Theory podcast and founder of Quest Nutrition, Tom Bilyeu. What's up, man? Great to see you again, man. How you doing? Dude, it's good to have you back. I had a lot of fun yesterday. No doubt, man. Tom, I know who you are. A lot of people out there know who you are. But for my listeners who are like, who's this guy? Please introduce yourself. Cool. I'll give it to you in a really brief nutshell. So go to film school in the late 90s. Have no idea how to break into the industry. Meet these successful entrepreneurs. They say, uh, if you want to control the art, you need to control the resources. So you should get into business and get rich. And I thought, yeah, that's brilliant. That way I could build my own studio. This sounds amazing. Uh, got into business. I thought it would take 18 months. It took 15 years, but it worked. And so built several companies along the way, but the one that I'm most known for is Quest Nutrition. So took that from not existing to being valued at a billion dollars in five years. Pretty insane ride because we were in manufacturing. So you're going from three employees to 3,000 employees. It was absolute bananas. Uh, exited that company, sold it, uh, started Impact Theory literally the next day. So my last day at Quest was Monday. And then because I was doing all of that to build the studio, started the next day and uh, half a billion views later, here we are. Here we are, podcast over. There you go, guys. That's how you do it. it. No, okay, so there's a lot to get into right there, man. But rewinding back a little bit, of course, you started with film school. But tell me a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up? So grew up in Tacoma, Washington, uh, sort of on the bottom rung of uh, lower middle class, like right teetering between middle class, lower middle class. Uh, used to think I grew up poor and then I encountered real poverty and was like, ah, no, I did not grow up poor. Um, but that was how it felt. And so that really put a chip on my shoulder where as a kid, I remember saying, A, no one's ever gonna make me do things that I don't wanna do ever again. Uh, and I'm going to get rich. And so from the time that I was 12, I would tell anybody who would listen, I'm gonna get rich, I'm gonna get rich, I'm gonna get rich. And nobody in my family was wealthy. Nobody had ever met anybody that was wealthy. And so I used to get made fun of a lot in my family for being that guy. Uh, but it was a really exciting motivator for me. So it didn't come from a dark place. I was just like, this is so exciting. Like the sense that I can go do and be what I want. And my mom did a phenomenal job of telling me like, hey, you can really go become what you want. Now she didn't think I would actually do it, which is a whole <laughs> nother story. Uh, but that really seeped into my subconscious and over time overcame a lot of internal obstacles to finally get where I wanted to go. Um, and yeah, so started in a random corner of America, uh, and just fought my way to the big city. What were you like as a kid? Well, so, uh, I once asked my mom, cause I thought of myself as funny, mm -hmm. uh, which anybody that's watched <laughs> me for a while is going to be like, bro, uh, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, but really as a kid, I, I believe that I was very funny mm -hmm. and I used to, um, do comedy routines all the time. Uh, and for literally through high school, I would do on stage stand up comedy. I would do lunchroom comedy. And then at one point in here in LA, even did the Laugh Factory. Mm. Um, that, that's a whole nother story. But when I asked my mom what I was like as a kid, she said, I said, Mom, was I funny as a kid? And she goes, You were busy. <laughs> and so I was like, Okay, that's a good gut check. Uh, so yeah, I was diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder as a kid. Okay. These days it would have been ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, but my mom refused to medicate me. She was like, as long as he's sleeping through the night, then I don't want to mess with that. And Good. there was a family friend that was medicated and it was stunting his growth. And so my mom was just like really concerned about mm -hmm. that. Obviously now I'm super grateful that she didn't. Um, and yeah, and my friends though would have told you I was funny for sure. So, um, 
that's that's okay. my view. On what about, what about your father? Uh, my dad was. Of his own in me. I love my dad. I want to be very clear. And as adults, we get along extremely well. Okay. Uh, my dad, of his own admission, was not somebody that had kids and was like, oh, I'm glad I had kids. Mm. So he had kids. Bless him. He was a fun guy. Actually, I have zero negative memories of my dad. But my dad just wasn't around a lot. Okay. So he threw himself into his work. Uh, he had a deep passion for working on cars. Mm. And in his defense, if I had loved cars, we would have spent a lot of time together. But I hated working on cars. And so the outlet that we had, I wasn't into. Now, if you want to be a psychologist about it all, the one thing that we did bond over was film. And that goes to be the thing that I end up pursuing. Now, admittedly, when I turn inward, it doesn't feel like I did it for that reason. We all know that in today's fast-paced world, it's harder than ever to live a healthy lifestyle. Just about everyone is struggling with gut issues, stress, inflammation, fatigue, or immune health issues. Most of it comes down to diet, but getting nutrient-rich food consistently isn't always easy or affordable. With hectic schedules, processed foods, and the rising cost of healthy options, we all need a cheat code as the game of life gets a little bit more difficult. My cheat code is Optimal Human. With over 90 ingredients, including powerful vitamins and other nutrients, one serving of Optimal Human helps me fulfill my daily nutritional needs. And in my opinion, it tastes better than other green supplements on the market. Optimal Human contains powerful superfoods like organic reishi mushroom for your brain, turmeric root for your joints, beetroot for cardiovascular health, CoQ10 for cellular health, and prebiotics for gut health. It's simple to integrate into your daily life. Just add one scoop to water, a smoothie, or your protein shake and get an instant delicious nutrient boost. Try Optimal Human today and get 50% off your first month by going to OptimalHuman.com forward slash Zuby. One more time, that's OptimalHuman.com forward slash Zuby. Go check it out. So tell me about getting into film school. So you go to normal school and then what happens after that? So uh, when when I graduated film school, I thought I would get the three picture deal. Like I, I did very well in film school. Okay. So I had cheated my way through high school, always with the excuse that um, this stuff is BS. Like they're really not teaching me the things that I need to know. Do you mean literally cheated? Literally way cheated. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, hey, you're smarter than me. Let me <laughs> literally, I, the one thing I will say is I was charming. Yeah. Uh, so the teachers didn't actively look away but they gave me room to roam, let's say. So I was able to get somebody's test, just put it on my desk, copy line for line so I could show all my work. I did that a lot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, had one teacher who would let me retake the test. So anyway, I ended up doing well in high school, but I did not earn it at all. Uh, and when I went to film school though, I was like, okay, hold on, I'm gonna take on debt. And this is supposedly the thing that I want to do. And I always allowed myself to cheat in high school because I was like, well, this isn't what you want to do anyway. None of this stuff is going to be useful, which I want to go back and punch myself because I could have been learning that whole time and wasn't. And I think that's a huge mistake given all that knowledge is useful. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I couldn't see it. That was the reason that I gave myself when I went to college. That reason didn't make sense anymore. So I made a promise to myself before the first day of class, A or F, sink or swim, I will never cheat and uh, held true to that and did better in college than I did in high school. So I was like, whoa. But it was the first time in my life where I found discipline. Mm -hmm. So my mom didn't think I was gonna be successful. When I left for college, she just quietly assumed I was gonna come home. She never said that yeah. until much later when I was successful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she was like, you were so lazy as a kid. I did not think you would be successful. And at college, motivated by this thing that I loved, which was storytelling, I was like, oh, to get good at this, I just really have to buckle down. And that paid off massively. Cool. What is it that drew you into film and storytelling? You just said you love storytelling. Is that something that you always had since childhood? Or what do you think sparked that creativity? So I think we're 50% hardwired and 50% malleable. Okay. And if we were in like way history, evolutionary times, I would not be the chief of the tribe. I would be the storyteller for mm. sure. Like that is my, my natural abilities are very much along the lines of knowing how to tell a good story, knowing how to engage people, um, how to take an idea and either turn it into a story or distill it to its essence. So that's always come very intuitively to me. Uh, and I've always said the Everybody has a thing where they will get disproportionate return on their time. Mm -hmm. If I put time into verbal things, 
I, I get better way faster than the normal person. Okay. So let's say if I put time and energy into math, I'll get better, but it's like at 0.8. So you feel how oh, it's really hard. This takes me longer than most people. It just, nothing comes intuitively. If I put time and energy into anything verbal, I'm like a 1.3. Mm -hmm. So it's like, now I'm getting a disproportionate return immediately that any amount of time that I put there is gonna come back to me a thousand fold. This is why I started podcasting. Got it. So I'm building a protein bar company, but I started a podcast, which at the time, everyone was like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I just knew that this speaks to my natural abilities. And so now if I pour gas on that fire and really study and push myself, I'm going to get that disproportionate return. Um, and so I'm always looking for those things that I can get that kind of return out of. That makes sense. So after film school, I'm just tracking all this because you've, you've done so many different things. It's like mm -hmm. you've lived all these different lives. So after film school, I take it you were pursuing a career in that industry for some time. What was the story after film school? How did so I graduate in 98, there are no cell phones with cameras on it. YouTube mm -hmm. doesn't exist. So to get an agent, you have to make a short film. The short film's gonna cost you like, I mean like a hundred grand. It's okay. just, you could do it for less, of course, but it's like- hundred grand in really, that time's money? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you really wanted to do something um, that would really get people's attention, it was just gonna be very expensive. Mm. And so I was like, man, I don't know anybody with that kind of money. Uh, so I had worked enough on film sets in film school that I knew I did not want to be a PA on big films and struggle my way because it, it's just too many hours. And I didn't know what I know now about networking and being in the universe of, as I call it. So I actually made what I think now is a mistake. If I knew what I knew now and could go back in time, I would do it very differently. But the decision I made was I don't want to be a PA. I want a job that gives me time to write. And I'm gonna follow in M. Night Shyamalan's path, write the great American screenplay, have something so good that it can't be denied, and get a studio to say, oh, even though you've never directed anything before, this script is so good that we're gonna let you direct it. Mm -hmm. Total delusion, but like that was the animating thing, and so I was always looking for these remedial jobs where I could get time to write these screenplays. And so immediately after college, my life is a nightmare and I'm um, selling video games retail. Uh, I once had a job for about 18 hours driving lingerie models mm. from private ex ex uh, exposition <laughs> to private exhibition. And- That's not bad. Uh, well, so my mom, uh, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> literally she calls me and uh, it's the middle of the day and she wakes me up and she's like, what are you doing sleeping in the middle of the day? I'm like, I have a new job. Mm. What's your new job? Driving. What are you driving? Models. <laughs> what kind of models? <laughs> Lingerie models. They're prostitutes. So she freaked out. She was like, there's no way you have to immediately call and quit this job. And so being a good son, I called up and I'm like, all right, guys, sorry, I can't do this. So I never actually did it, but going through the training and stuff was hilarious. So were, were they actually lingerie models or was that um, no, a euphemism? Sure. Okay, fair enough. A hundred percent. But I was like, models. hey, I get to sit in the car and wait, and I get a right. And you know, they're technically models, so I'm fine. That's so funny. Tell me about um, Founding Quest Nutrition. I'm sure this is a story you've told many, many times. But yeah. how did you, that's a totally different world from filmmaking. So what was that segue there? Yeah. So, uh, it's a very big story that I'll give you in a nutshell, but okay. if you want to press on anything, okay. know that there's plenty of depth anywhere you want to go. Sure. Uh, so I meet these guys, successful entrepreneurs, they're starting a software company and they're like, Hey, we think you're bright. We'd love to hire you as a copywriter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, word, but they gave me a pitch. Don't think of yourself as a copywriter. You want to think of yourself as a partner in the company. And if you can create in us the fear of loss, where we would rather actually give you a piece of the company than lose you, mm -hmm. then you can really become a partner in the company. Okay. And so I heard them give that pitch like 50 people and nobody did anything with it. And I was like, this is my shot. Like if I can make money off this business, because uh, I already believe in this idea of get into business, get rich. And I was like, whoa, this is the opportunity. And so I told my wife, look, I just need 18 months. I'm going to walk away from teaching film, which is how I was making money at the time. I'm going to walk away from that. What year is this? Uh, this would have been 2002 or 2003. Okay. 
and uh, I'm gonna go and be a copywriter. And she's like, okay, yeah, let's give it a shot. And so 18 months comes and goes, we're nowhere closer. I just need 18 more months. Another 18 months comes and goes. Fast forward six to six and a half years in, and I've made so many rules about what my wife can and can't ask me about. <laughs> uh, don't ask me about how things are going at work. I don't wanna talk about it. Don't ask me about the other people that work there. It just all is stressful and triggering. Like I just, when I come home, I need space. Yeah. And so she tried to be good about it and give me that space. And finally she pulled me aside and said, you're now damaging our marriage. Mm. You've built so many walls because I was so unhappy you've built so many walls around you that it's creating a lot of distance. And so I was like, look, I just wanna feel alive again. And, but I've promised you, and I've promised your dad, because her dad didn't want us to get married. Okay. I mean, he told me straight up, I asked for his blessing, he said no. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty hardcore. Okay. And uh, he was just like, I don't I wanna, think- I'll wanna get more into yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, great man, amazing man, learned a lot from him, mm -hmm. but he was not shy about saying, you're not where you need to be to take care of my daughter. So anyway, I've got this huge chip on my shoulder yeah. about, I promised him I was gonna make you a rich woman. I promised you I was gonna make you a rich woman. I've made you clip coupons now for six plus years, uh, all the while saying, I just need 18 months, 18 months, 18 months. And so we agreed that I would go in and quit and that it was better to pursue something that made me feel alive, which was the phrase I kept using, even if it wasn't making us money. Mm -hmm. So we had found a small town in Greece. My wife is Greek, found a small town in Greece where we could live very cheaply and I was gonna go write the screenplay. And so even though I wasn't gonna make a lot of money and she wouldn't make a lot of money, we'd be able to get by and then we would get that killer screenplay and come back. Okay. Uh, again, delusional, and I'm glad that this is not how the story ends, yeah. but armed with that very clear vision of, I wanna feel alive again, I'm damaging my marriage, I realize now showing up every day just to get rich just isn't motivation enough, because b by the way, by that point I'm worth $2 million on paper. Okay. So they did end up making me an owner, uh, the company was growing, it was worth about $22 million at the time that I go in and quit. And um, I completely catch them off guard. And I was like, here's your equity back. I'm not gonna cross the finish line, so I don't want anything for this. Okay. Uh, you guys go do it. Thank you for giving me a shot. This was incredible, but I need to feel alive. Yes. And so I'm driving home, talking to my wife. I did it, the hard part, because I really like, it ends up being this really powerful moment, but in the moment that it was happening, I felt like I was really letting them down. Mm -hmm. And so, cause we'd really become close. And I was just like, I did it, I did the hard thing. And now I, f I already feel better. Like let's, you know, pack up and move. Like let's go write this screenplay. And they call me, I'm pulling into the driveway at my house and they call me and I'm on the phone with my wife and I'm like, hold on a sec, they're calling me. Click over and they're like, just come to dinner with us. So I'm like, Hey babe, instead of coming in the house, I'm gonna go to dinner. I go to dinner with them. And they're like, look, you just totally caught us off guard. We actually feel the same way that you do. We haven't been happy for a long time either. Mm -hmm. So what would it look like? What would need to be true for the three of us to keep working together? And so we brainstormed ideas. We'd have to sell this current company because none of us care about the product. Uh, would need to be something that we would feel passionate about. And uh, I started, I didn't have the words that we have for it now, but this is in today's language. What I was saying was I need to feel authentic. I kept saying, I need to be myself. I need to be who I really am. Mm. I don't wanna be a slick marketer. I just wanna be me. And so, and I was like, and I wanna tell stories. And there's this thing that we now call social media, which we did not at the time, mm -hmm. But I'm like, there's this thing, Tim Kelly has this idea of a thousand true fans. And I laid out this whole thing about how we could do our own content. It wasn't called content back then, but like, look, I'm a filmmaker. Like, let me do this. Let's build a studio inside of what became a protein bar company, but let's create all of our own content. Let's really have the brand stand for something. This is all before, like, that was the thing. And this is part of why Quest blew up is we did all the things that became the standard playbook, but we were doing it three years before anybody mm. else. And so influencer marketing, creating our own content, standing for something, letting people know what our values are, like all this stuff that we were doing just so that the three of us could keep working together. Because what I'd realized, my, my business partners used to ask this question. And the first time I heard it, I thought, yeah, that's the right question to ask. And it, it was, if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? Yep. 
And over six years, I realized this is the dumbest question ever because failure is the most likely outcome. So I was like, okay, if failure is the most likely outcome, if you're trying to do something big, if you're trying to do something big and failure is the most likely outcome, what's a better question to ask yourself? And the question that I started asking myself was, okay, what would I do and love every day, even if I were failing? Mm. Pursue that thing. And suddenly it becomes about people that you know and love. Okay, I can build a thing for, in the case of Quest, for my mom and my sister. I can build a food company because they're both morbidly obese. Okay. I can build something for them so that they have food that they can choose based on taste. Mm. And I've done all the hard work to make sure that it's actually good for them. But I'm just thinking about them. Yep. So literally on a Friday night, this is a true story. On a Friday night, I am under a piece of wrapping equipment with blood on my knuckles, trying to repair the heat coupling device to get the machine to seal correctly. And all my friends are at clubs and out partying. I thought I'm here for my mom and my sister. And I'll what, show what, what machine is that? What? So you, the way that we did it, it's going to be different in different companies, okay. but we had a fin sealer. So okay. you've got this to wrap the bars. Yeah. So okay. you, you, they go through a wrapper that starts flat and the machine like pulls it down to right around the bar. And then there's a fin beneath it that like actually is heated mm -hmm. and it like squishes it together. And okay. it's made of a material that when it heats, it seals. Got it. You've opened a gazillion packages yeah. sealed with one of these things okay. in your life, but there's cold sealing and there's hot sealing. So if you've ever had like glue, that's a cold seal. If you have to tear it, mm -hmm. that's a hot seal. So anyway, we had a hot seal. We later switched okay. to glue, but at the time we had hot seal. How, how did you decide on protein bars? Okay. So you've got three people okay. and you're, what do we do next? And you're trying to triangulate on, okay, what I know is these two guys are extraordinary mm. and I want to keep working with them. And that means I'm going to have to make concessions. I'm not going to jump right to filmmaking. So what is it that the three of us share in common? And the three of us were obsessed with health and nutrition. Mm. And the three of us had an angle that we would do for the company. And it ended up being um, product, process, and people. Mm -hmm. And so one of my partners was product. He was literally obsessed with the science of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Another one was process, he grew up on an Iowa farm and ended up m making a huge breakthrough for us in manufacturing that just was so clutch. And then I was people. So storytelling, sales, marketing, uh, team building, that kind of stuff. And so when we looked at, okay, if we were to do that, then we could make use of each of our skill sets. And because I have such a personal connection to this through my mom and my sister, like I'm here for that. I've got an emotional tie. I'll be ready to go. And so in the beginning, it wasn't self-evident, but that one, and this is where I always tell people being a good person is not enough. You have to have business acumen. Mm -hmm. So by that point, they had been in business for more than a decade. I'd been in business by the time we started Quest for seven plus years. So you start to get what it takes to grow a business. So we understood, look, Sure, Tom, your mom and your sister are great. I always used to tell people, we, we're here for three very different reasons. Like they're not here fighting for my mom and my sister. Yeah. That's a me thing. But I knew that my mom and my sister were representative of hundreds of millions of people. Mm. So it was like, if we could actually solve a problem for them, there's probably a big business here. And for any budding entrepreneurs out there, man, if you've got a consumable product idea that solves a real problem, get into that business mm. because now you've got that recurring revenue, people coming back. It's, it's really magical. Wow. What was the first product that you guys put out there? The first two. So they came out at the same time okay. were our vanilla almond crunch bar okay. and our peanut butter bar. The reason I ask is because, you know, I remember I've been in the, I've been going to the gym for over 20 years. So I got into bodybuilding and then powerlifting and stuff when I was in my teens and I was in the UK at the time in boarding school in the UK. And I remember, I want to say in my early 20s, if not late teens, I remember hearing about Quest Bars on bodybuilding forums. Mm -hmm. In the UK, they weren't, they weren't really sold in the UK, definitely not in most of the supermarkets. So I remember, you know, you're chatting on these forums and all these like bodybuilder bros in the US are like talking about 
quest quest bars quest nutrition bars and whatever and like the people in the uk are like what what are those what are these so it wasn't until when did i first try a quest bar gosh it probably wasn't until about six or seven years ago but i just remember hearing i remember hearing that name so i'm just thinking as to as you guys are doing this and you're putting out these initial products i'm wondering if this is aligning at the same time i'm starting to see this name popping up on these pre-social media bodybuilding forums. For sure, yeah. I mean, that was a huge part of the strategy okay. was we wanted people that were a walking billboard that would get people to ask one question, one question only, what do you eat? <laughs> and so we went out everywhere that they were, bodybuilding competitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we'd call them fitness influencers, but it really didn't exist back then. I mean, no, this is like 2009 when we really started getting serious. We officially launched in 2010. Mm -hmm. Um, but all the lingo that we have now was, you know, not around back then. And so we went out to these guys that were just in killer shape and we're like, all right, we want to give you the product. It works. You'll see that it works. And all we want is when somebody says, what do you eat? Be honest. And if it's us, tell them it's us. If it's yeah. not us, then tell them. And that was our whole shtick was if you think our bars are garbage, tell people you think our bars are garbage. Mm -hmm. And so people are like, whoa, like they're not holding, like if we signed somebody to rep the brand, we never said you have to talk about us this many times or anything like that, at least not in the early days. I'm sure later we started yeah. getting more serious. But in the beginning, it was just like, we want you to say what you believe to be true. Because if you call and ask us what you should eat, all of our customer support agents are trained to tell you, eat chicken breast and broccoli. Mm -hmm. And only when you're like, ah, I can't eat another chicken breast <laughs> and broccoli, then it's like, okay, have a Quest Bar. Yeah. So we try to be really honest that you wanna eat whole food whenever humanly possible, but we get it. There are times where you want something tasty or more convenient. And so that's where Quest enters the picture. What was the moment when you knew you had like, when did you know we've got something truly special here? It was about eight months in. Okay. And at first we couldn't even give them away. It, it was so funny to think back to, because everyone's like, I don't eat protein bars. Like mm -hmm. if you went to a bodybuilding show, which is where we would go, get a booth and try to give them away, um, people would just say, I don't eat protein bars. Protein bars are junk. Mm -hmm. And so our whole like carnival bark, you know, you know this from selling CDs, like you've <laughs> got this super narrow window. Yep where you're like, okay, I might be able to convince this person. This is why I was asking you yesterday, like, what do you look for? Because yeah. when we would do this, you'd be like, okay, this, like you, I'd be like, bro, those arms? <laughs> like, cause you'd be walking up, all right, bro, I see you, you gotta come here. You gotta like hear about this bar. Yeah. And it's the first bar that tastes like it has sugar, but doesn't. Mm. And so we tell people, eat it and check your blood sugar. And so like that became like the mantra was just getting people to understand we understood nutrition and we had found a way around the curse of the protein bar, which was that most protein bars to make it palatable, just cram like 30, 40 grams of sugar. It was insane. Yep. And so we're like, yeah, we didn't do that. We found another way around this problem, which was to become our own manufacturer, which mm -hmm. is its own thing. Um, and that, that like really started popping us off. That's awesome, man. I think a lot of people who are into fitness and nutrition now or are getting it into, into it now, they don't realize how much things have changed even just in the last 20 years. So I think now when it comes to, I don't know, protein bars or ready to drink protein shakes or whatever it might be, even just the internet world of fitness and the gym culture, it's shifted a lot. So now when people think of protein bars, they might think, oh gosh, there's so many available out there and you know, lots of them taste good and have decent macros and so on. But not so long ago, that was not the case. They were pretty nasty. <laughs> so they were pretty nasty. And the ones that did taste okay, as you said, they were just, they were just like Snickers bars, but with 20 grams of protein, if not probably less, probably worse than Snickers bars in certain ways, they'd all like mess up your gut. Mm -hmm. They'd like be, like, it was it was really, really different. So it's, it's strange, because when you say 20, 2009, 2010, perhaps to my younger, my youngest listeners, that will sound like a long time ago, but to people who are, let's say 30 plus, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem that long ago. So it doesn't seem like the world has changed that much, but this is just sort of the, there was that golden era of like YouTube, YouTube fitness and mm -hmm. YouTube bodybuilding. 
And then again, this is before Instagram. Now, when people think of fitness on the internet, they pro their brains probably go to Instagram before they go to YouTube. Yeah. And it's just changed and grown from the, the training to the nutrition to like so many more girls lift weights now. Mm -hmm. When I was lifting, when I was training 18, 20 years ago, I mean, I don't think, I can't even, I went to boarding school. And a lot of the guys would lift weights because we were all like rugby players and stuff. But I can't even recall if any of the girls lifted weights. Mm. I think like it was just the guys lifted weights. And in lots of gyms around the world, you go to the weight room. You might have like one or two hardcore bodybuilding ladies in there. But it was pretty much just totally male dominated. Now you go to a gym and it's not, you know, it's not just, you know, the guys lift the weights and the girls are on the treadmill. Now it's just like, you know pretty close to maybe 60 40 but you've got way more way more women way. lifting weights now and it's just it's changed in a lot of ways massively yeah um so gosh where do i want to go for now so you scale the company over the course of time from three people to three thousand people i don't want to go into all the intricacies of scaling that but what were some of the key steps or milestones along the way there? So the big one was just getting the bar to produce at scale. So we started in a kitchen that we rented by the hour mm. and we made them by hand with rolling pins Oh wow! and a couple like weird things that we made that would cut more than one bar at a time. Just uh, the three of you? Uh, we or would always get help. So we, there'd be like the three of us plus wives, plus every now and then <laughs> a couple other people, but it was, you know, what you could fit in a room about this size. Okay. Uh, so it was pretty small. We'd make a few hundred bars a night, maybe a thousand. I forget now the exact number, but it was not a lot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we'd run the software company by day and do the protein bars nights and weekends. And, um, yeah, it was really, really small time. And so we knew if we were going to scale, we were going to have to find equipment and we went around all over the place looking for a line and people were like, you're never going to be able to make this bar. You don't understand. It's actually a pretty fascinating lesson in there. Why were they saying that? Be, well, they wouldn't have been able to articulate why they would just say it won't, it won't run on the equipment. It won't mm -hmm. run on the equipment. Like, but we were like, what do you mean? It won't run on the equipment. Like it didn't make any sense. And so we would go rent their facility, try to run it. And it really wouldn't run on the equipment, and, okay. but we didn't know enough to understand why it's not running on the equipment. This is utterly fascinating. Zuby, stop me if, if this ends up not being interesting for your audience, but this is such a life thing that I've learned immutably over time because I've done so many different things now. There's, there's this initial naivete that you have, and it's a superpower, but it's also going to walk you into blind alleys. And so the joke we always used to make is, if I had known the light at the end of the tunnel was an oncoming train, I would not have gone down the path of becoming our own manufacturer. But by becoming our own manufacturer, we were able to make a bar that other people couldn't make. Now, I went through the same thing as we become a game developer now here at Impact Theory. Just things that I was like, how, why are people saying this can't be done? Like, I can think through the problem. This is going to be very easy. And then you try it and you're like, oh, my God. Like, there's just all these things that unfold that you realize, oh, people in the industry, they know all these things. Mm -hmm. But there's a great quote. I forget who said it. Anytime an expert tells you how something can be done, believe them. Every time an expert tells you how something can't be done, don't believe them. Mm. And so it, it's this weird conundrum of you have to throw yourself into this thing, make a ton of mistakes, waste a lot of time, look like a fool to finally orient yourself to, oh, okay, I see now how to pull this off. But hopefully you will have leapt in with a, a vision so audacious that as you fight your way through that, like, oh my God, now I understand, oh God, like this problem spiraling out of control, but you don't give up and you push all the way through. And by doing that, you actually create something that nobody else was able to create. But you literally had to be fooled in the beginning. If, if I had known how hard game development was going to be, I certainly wouldn't have done what we did. I would have still gotten into games, but not the way that we did. Mm. So we ended up creating something that nobody else has built because nobody else was dumb enough. Now, back at Quest, it was the same thing. We became our own manufacturer because we didn't understand how hard it was gonna be. And so we just saw a problem and we're like, wait, we, we see how to solve this problem only to then have just an unimaginable number of other problems unfold before you. And this is where entrepreneurs quit. This, this is like, I teach entrepreneurship and this is the one idea I always try to get across. And we're gonna find out how highbrow your audience is because I'm gonna say the truth, even though people hate it when I say it this way, but I say it this way because it's fucking true. 
you were up against the second law of thermodynamics, which simply states everything in the universe moves towards chaos. Nothing, when left alone, will assemble itself into an Alfa Romeo or a Ferrari, right? Never going to happen. Mm -hmm. The metal's not going to refine itself. The engine's not going to build itself. It just, that's not the way things work. Unless it's a closed system into which you can pour energy, okay? That's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, it's a very accurate and fancy way of saying the world really is working against you. It's working against you because, and here's why what we learned in manufacturing, for the last 70 years, because the U.S. government, now you get me all conspiracy here, but the U.S. government decided to subsidize corn so that you can make high fructose corn syrup. Now, because it's being subsidized, it becomes like prevalent everywhere. And so now if you're a machine manufacturer and you know everybody's going to put this stuff in, you engineer your mass produce equipment to expect high fructose corn syrup because that's what everybody's using. And so now without even thinking about it, you're like, this is the kind of material we can expect to run through this type of machine because it's always going to have high fructose corn syrup. So the second we took the sugar out, we're removing high fructose corn syrup. And so even though we put a liquid fiber in there, its properties are just different enough that it literally breaks the equipment. Wow. And so now you're like, oh my God, I now understand because we were asking ourselves over and over, how has nobody made this bar? This is so obvious. And the answer is, I bet everybody tried. But when they got to the point where, oh, we either have to add high fructose corn syrup mm -hmm. to make our product, which is why you have 20 grams of sugar or yeah. 20 grams of protein inside of a Snickers bar, or I have to build my own equipment. They all said, I'm going to add the sugar. Mm -hmm. We were literally the only ones that were like, nah, we'll build the equipment. Okay. Now, when people understand that, that that defines my whole life, that I make that decision over and over and over and over. And you you need a little naivete going into it because becoming your own manufacturer is an insane undertaking. But when you've already started down that path and you've designed all the packaging and you're making it and you're selling it, and mm. only then do you find out, oh, actually, this is going to be insanely difficult. It's tough. But if you have that mentality of like, uh, I can get so good at a thing that people can't stop me. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I want people to take away. So when I encountered that same idea in video games, I was like, okay, I know this drill now. And I just have to get so good at game design that I'll, I'll be able to build a thing that other people won't have the tenacity, quite frankly, to build because the second law of thermodynamics will win against them mm. because they're not willing to pour the amount of energy into the system that they need to. Now, I don't know how many people in your audience have a physique, but dear Zuby's audience that has a physique. You mean an impressive physique or just yeah. assuming everyone has one? I'm hoping everyone a, has a body. A good physique. Okay. <laughs> a physique that they can compete in physique competitions physique. Oh, okay. A small percentage. Yes. Very small. Under, under a percent. So those guys will understand immediately what I'm talking about. So one of the most important things that you can do to convince yourself that everything that I just said in the last seven minutes is true is to transform your body. Mm -hmm. It will teach you everything from it's extremely hard to the world is working against you, both in intentional ways and unintentional ways from if you're in the U S uh, even granting that the government has your best interests at heart. They're making such stupid decisions uh, that your food is just inundated with things that will move you backwards. Um, to if you stop working out because you get sick, now your physique is gonna slowly begin to erode, that you're storing amino acids in your muscles, and if you get sick, your body's gonna go strip those amino acids, and so you're gonna have to build them back up, both mm -hmm. in diet and exercise. And so it's just like doing it's hard. Yep. But if you transform your body, you suddenly go, oh, this works. I just have to be hyper-focused, extremely consistent, and willing to suffer. Man, you've said so many interesting things there. I mean, from the technical part to the more philosophical part. Firstly, on a technical level, I mean, it, that's really fascinating about the high fructose corn syrup that the machines quite literally don't function without it. That's mind blowing to me. Yup. I wouldn't have even thought that that would have been the technical issue. But I think what you've just said there about that moment of tenacity and breaking through is so powerful. I say often that in most things, I believe that in most things, most people give up far too early. 
and a lot of success, regardless of the scale of it, but a lot of success is just going, just outlasting other people, doing what most people just won't. As human beings, we naturally crave comfort. We all do to varying degrees. There's, you know, we want to be comfortable. We like to be comfortable. But as a result, as soon as there is resistance, and as, re as there is resistance, and as that resistance increases, more and more people fall away. More and more people drop off. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not hard to, like, okay, we're talking about working out or working out or dieting. It's not that hard to convince. Maybe you could convince 50 to 70% of the population to go to the gym once. There's a percent that you try as you might. You can't even get them to come on, like, just, just go one time and they mm -hmm. still won't do it, right? Cool. Okay, that, that percentage is already gone. You can get most people to go to a session to try it once. Then even just getting a second one in, you're going to get quite a significant drop off from that first one to the second. You see this at the beginning of every year, you get all the January joiners to the gym, new year, new me, I'm pumped up this time. You go in first week of January, the gym is busy, all of these new people. And then just by the end of January, beginning of February, majority of those new faces, you're not seeing them anymore. And so much of it is just that consistency of just keep going. And to get to the furthest levels, I mean, I've I talk to and I know a lot of highly successful people at this point, and there are certain traits that a lot of people have, but one of them is just that set tenacity and that consistency and a level of self-belief that is by quote unquote normal standards delusional. There has to be a level of delusion because if you're doing something that hasn't been done or is extremely difficult or which is just slightly different from the way things are normally done, then most people are going to tell you that either it's completely impossible or you just can't do it or it's difficult or, well, if it could be done, someone would have already done it. Mm -hmm. And most people will just hear that and be like, oh, okay, then well, let me change my mind or let me give up. And it takes someone who is pure delusion won't get you there because you need to have the ability to actually execute and you need to have the talent and the idea needs to be good enough that people care about it. Um, but yeah, where do you think, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this because you've only ever been yourself and you might not know where all these things come from, but where, where do you think that level of, let's call it delusional self-belief, where do you think that stems from? Well, this is where you and I will disagree Perhaps, depending on how you look at it. But for me, it, evolution has one aim for you, which is to get you to have kids that survive long enough to have kids. It has two levers that it can pull, pleasure and pain. And through pleasure and pain, it is trying to get you to do certain behaviors. And if you knew how difficult it was going to be to fend off the outside world and all the things that would try to kill you and all that, uh, then you probably wouldn't embark upon it. Mm. But if on the other hand, it gives you this sense of optimism and a sense of I can do it, that at least you'll a certain type of person, because to your point, most people stop way too early, but there is a rare set of people that whatever that dial is, is, is dialed up maybe bizarrely high. And those are the people that go on and do great things. Mm. Because if you think of it just really oversimplistically and say, okay, no matter what you try to achieve, you will achieve less than you're attempting to achieve. And so now you're maximally incentivized to try the craziest thing. Because at least then you're thinking in a way of like, oh, this is gonna make me do big things. So anybody paying attention knows, you use Elon Musk now as the example. And you just say, Okay, this guy's trying to make us a multi-planetary species. So that means that I've got to build all these rockets and they've got to be this size and I've got to get these government contracts. And first I have to start with satellites. And I've got to generate revenue and all this stuff. And he's, so he's got this big, massive plan. But if you were just trying to, say, develop the satellites and you weren't trying to make us a multi-planetary species, then all of a sudden you don't need to build as big of a rocket. And so you may have still solved the same rocket problem that he solved, but you don't solve it at the scale that he solves it to because he has a much 
bigger idea of what he can and wants to accomplish. And so all of us are going to fall short. And so just trying to, from an evolutionary standpoint, evolution, having a, a and look, I believe in the blind watchmaker. I don't think this is intentional, but if you have that dial and some people just get it cranked way up, then modern society brought to you by that small subset of people that have that dial that's just cranked abnormally high uh, on, on I'll call self-belief rather than delusion. Sure. And then when combined with persistence, they just all of a sudden it's like, oh, I've got this crazy dream. It's so big. Everybody else is going to quit, but not me. And then they just keep going. And most of them honestly still fail despite mm -hmm. having that. But the few that make it through give you the just unbelievable modern world that we see before us. That's fascinating. I've just had a thought of you as you th said that. Because you use the term self-belief. You replace the term delusion with self-belief. And I've just thought of what delusion really is. And delusion is the, I've never articulated this, so I'm going to try Delusion is the gap between your self-belief or a person's self-belief and their competence slash ability to do the thing, ability to execute. It's that gap. I'll add one element to that. Okay. As perceived by somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so... It's possible because I've never thought of myself as delusional, though yeah. I have been because there are things that I've failed to achieve. So I clearly was delusional. But there are things that I did achieve that mm -hmm. other people did not think I could. And so during the period where I'm unproven, I look delusional. And you look so, it, but you're not. So you, I, you, I you look delusional to an outsider. Analysis. But yeah. in reality, you're not because that gap is not a gap you can you have got the capability and the capacity and the will to make it happen so yeah to an outsider it looks delusional but you know within yourself no actually that is something that you believe but you're often wrong that's mm -hmm. why i think and look for the sake of a podcast it probably doesn't matter but yeah. just by way of personal interest it's fascinating to me i never think i'm delusional mm -hmm. though i am at times yes in in the final analysis proven to be wrong okay so if if I don't think I'm delusional, am I delusional? Or does it require somebody else to look at me and go, this is impossible, that's delusion. And the reason I think this matters is everybody needs to understand about themselves. You are both the shout and the echo. So you're the thing that you do mm -hmm. and you will assimilate what comes back to you, especially now in the age of social media, but this has always been true. <laughs> so you're gonna do a thing and people are attempt a thing and people are gonna tell you you're delusional. Now, the people that can fight through that, even when they, if they're being honest, they don't know if they'll be able to pull it off. Like I'm trying to build the next Disney. Okay. Now, just speaking statistically, the odds are essentially 100% that I fail. So I have to set aside that this could be delusion because I know I will only be limited by what I attempt. And so if I accept that uh, it, no one can do that, so don't even try, scale that back, I'm gonna fall short of whatever that is. So I'm willing to say, even though the echo that I get back is that this is delusion, mm -hmm. that I'm gonna keep pushing through that. But if I get taken, if I get caught off guard, because I do not understand the nature, that delusion is simply the gap between what I have already proven I can do and what I can do mm -hmm. as seen by somebody else, then it becomes, it feels like it's, they're presenting me actuality. And what I'm saying is in the moment before you do it, nobody knows if it's delusion or if it's just your part way to being finished. Yes. And to confound it even more, when we started Quest, we were not capable of scaling Quest. We had to become capable of scaling Quest to scale it, yes. but we actually weren't. I'm not as of today capable of building the next Disney. So I have to become capable of building the next Disney as I go. So anybody that looks at me, like my mom looked at me, like my father-in-law looked at me, like my best friend looked at me, all three thought I was gonna fail in life mm -hmm. with love in their hearts, yes. but all three thought I would fail. They ended up being wrong, but they weren't wrong in the moment. And this is what I always try to get people to understand is when they said, you're not gonna be able to pull this off, what they meant was, because of their own worldview, given the skills that you have today, mm -hmm. you're not capable of doing the thing you say you're going to do. What they didn't account for is that I have obscene ambition. It wasn't your final form. Correct. 
I wasn't in my final form. Yeah. And so as I used my discipline to garner skills that would match my ambition, then I could pull it off. Yes. And so if you're ready for that dissonance of, ooh, the world's gonna tell me I'm an idiot, I'm a fool, that I'm never gonna be able to achieve this, and you know that's just how people work, that's the echo, go be the shout, worry about the echo later. Yeah, tell me about building the next Disney. Okay, so uh, it's so interesting because ideology has a really bad name, and when I watch companies like Disney become ideological, I'm, I get the heebie-jeebies, <laughs> but Impact Theory is an ideologically driven company. So I believe that most people will not achieve what they could in life because they have bad software running on their brain. Okay. And that software that they're running tells them that they were dealt a hand of cards and it just is what it is. And sorry, kiddo, that you didn't get a good hand of cards. You were born uh, poor. That's just that. You were born an ethnicity that nobody cares about. It's just that. You're never going to be able to do your thing. And so um, I've worked in the inner cities so much. I've just seen this eat exceptionally intelligent people mm. alive. And so I'd be looking at somebody that I'm like, hold on, you, you are smarter than me meaning that they can process raw data faster than I can. So, I mean, it, it, it isn't hard to see somebody who's just smart, yes. but then you can look at their life and be like, but whoa, like you're not doing anything with your life. So I actually asked this kid one time, I was like, uh, you were smarter than me. We both know that. So why are you doing nothing with your life? And he was like, um, my mom told me that the world does not want people who look like me to succeed. Mm. And I was just like, oh fuck. It was so defeating because I, I put so much time and energy into these guys, like helping them grow and get better. I have a whole set of reasons for why I was doing that back then. But anyway, I was doing it. And so to hear that, I was like, so you're not even gonna try? It just seemed so absurd. And so I was like, wow, so your life is being hemmed in by an idea. Because that idea, all of your behaviors are downstream of that idea. So you believe no matter how hard I try, I will never succeed because people don't want people that look like me to succeed. And I was like, look, given that that governs your behaviors and what attempts that you make, you have to get rid of that belief. And so I became obsessed with the idea that I'm almost certain every problem that we have as a society is an ideas problem. And I became convinced and am convinced to this day that generational poverty is not about money, it's about ideas and they have a terrible set of ideas, they have terrible education, but those ideas end up impacting things like the language centers of their brain because their moms were never taught that the number of words your kid hears by the age of five will dramatically impact the language centers of their brain. Mm -hmm. And so you have to read to your kids. That's a potent idea. And if a mother believes I have to read to my kid every night and that my goal is five million words by the time they're five, uh, and a ratio of 70% positive to 30% negative, uh, then that idea will dictate their behavior and that child's language centers in their brain, which will not change once they're past like 11, uh, they will develop profoundly and they will have advantages in life that somebody else won't. That, that's how an idea ends up echoing through somebody. So anyway, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, this is an ideas problem. Uh, we need to address it. So. I want to, because originally I just wanted to build a studio to tell stories. And then I became evangelical about putting messages in my stories, like my favorite films of all time anyway, Star Wars, The Matrix, um, so many others, The Karate Kid, Rocky, Rocky IV, Shawshank Redemption. All of those are ideological stories. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like it. The when Disney, you say ideological, what do you mean by that? There word? is a point to the story. Okay. And so if you look at um, Star Wars is Buddhism okay. mixed with Taoism turned into a story. So, uh, hey, kid, there's this powerful force running through you. If you learn to quiet your mind and listen to it, you can tap into its power. The bad news is if you do that via anger and resentment, it's actually in small moments more powerful than the light side. You will find it easier, it's more facile. And so you're gonna be tempted at every step of the way to just grab hold of that dark force, that dark energy. 
but that will end up destroying you. But there's a light side. It's harder to reach into. It's harder to tap into. You're going to have to be one with it. You're going to have to let go of your technology. You're going to have to let go of your busy mind. I mean, it is literally stripped from the pages of uh, the Buddhist texts and the Tao Te Ching. And I, as I grew up and actually encountered the Tao Te Ching, I realized, oh my God, if you take Yoda's advice, your life will actually be better. And so I just thought, wow, that's really brilliant. So flash forward, you know, 15 years later, and I'm trying to impart all these ideas to people at their job, realizing only 2% of people do something with these ideas. I was like, okay. Where'd you get that 2% from? I made it up, but it's oh, like okay. roughly. Gotcha. So if you take 100 people and you give them all the same ideas, two of them will go do something. It'll change right. their life forever, but 98% won't. Is that exact science? Obviously not. Got it. But it, directionally, that really is correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so my wife and I became obsessed with the 98% and I've got a whole thing. We could do a whole podcast about how I built my thesis about why you have to go to kids, how you have to be telling these ideas through narrative, um, why that works, why you want to target them in what's known as the age of imprinting, which mm -hmm. is 11 to 15. The Japanese actually have a word for this. It's called shonen, which translates as the few years. So any parent knows there's a few years where your kid goes from my little darling to pushing you away to going towards their friends. They find music, their favorite movies. Like they start drinking deeply of culture mm -hmm. and I can't control where you grow up, which is the number one predictor of your future success because of the impact it will have on the ideas that you absorb. So I can't control the zip code you're born into. Can't control your parents or what ideas monopolize their minds but I can control what your friends think is cool. And so that became the obsession was, can I implant empowering ideas and stories such that if you take a mentor's advice from our story, that it will actually make your life better. And then that offered an organizing principle to the kind of stories that we tell. And so the mantra around here is, all right, if Disney could make the most magical place on earth by telling one kind of story over and over and over, can we make the most empowering place on earth by telling one kind of story over and over and over? And the kind of story that we want to tell is a story of somebody who goes from weak to strong, mm -hmm. sort of the inverse of what Disney's done with the female Star Wars stuff where they're already strong and they're just already amazing. They had to do nothing to earn it. <laughs> and it, it's, that's really sad because yeah. there, there have been badass female characters for a long ass time. And part of it, like take a Sarah O'Connor, it's a mother who's like, it's, it's mama bear as a movie. Mm -hmm. You will not fuck with my child, no matter what I have to do. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, right? It's taking these true feminine, not only ideals, but just these raw truths that archetypes. we've all known. Exactly, yeah. these, these incredible female archetypes and put them up on the big screen in a way that we can all be like, fuck yeah. And now it's just completely different. You strip them of all their femininity. Mm. You strip them of any need to earn something. And you just say, uh, you're a man, but better. Yeah. Why do you think they've taken that route with that specifically? Here's, okay. yeah, here's where I was going to say, cause I, um, I'm not a huge watcher of a lot of these things, but I hear people complaining about it all the time. So I don't think I've seen a star Wars movie since episode one, which was probably 20 years ago. So, but I, I hear people complaining all the time, you know, the diehard fans who are just, they're just complaining nonstop. So I see all the complaints, but, and I see little clips of things that they're complaining about, but I'm not close enough to the subject matter to see how all of these characters are sort of being changed and transformed. But given those complaints, like Isaiah, why do you think people are doing that? So I, think this will be read funny by some people, but I, I will grant that it comes from a beautiful place. I will grant that it comes from you have a little girl, you have a daughter and you look at the world and go, women couldn't even vote until whatever 1920 or whatever stupid late date it mm -hmm. was. Uh, women weren't in the workforce on mass until like world war two. Uh, and I always debate this point. Tell me. I think this idea, this sort of modern feminist narrative that women haven't worked for most of human history or weren't in the workforce or whatever is just is just false. Women have always worked um, just in 
in different ways. I mean, from hunt, if you want to go back to, you know, hunter gatherer times, it was probably generally males doing the hunting, females doing the gathering. And then in agricultural times, like women have always worked. They maybe worked in the house. They didn't go to an, they didn't get in their car and go to an office, but they've always worked. And then in terms of obviously child rearing, I mean, <laughs> this, this idea that mothers don't, a stay at home mother does not work is goofy. I think it's silly that we just think of work as a job, like employment that pays money, whereas that's not necessarily what work or labor means. There's a lot of work that's extraordinarily important. Someone could argue that the most important work that exists in the world is not directly compensated in terms of money, whether it's a man doing it or it's a woman doing it. Like the most obvious example of this obviously is parenthood um that's not you're not compensated for being a father i mean it's pretty darn expensive to be, to be a father right um or for being a mother but i think there's that there's this idea that it was just like i don't know women were just kind of hanging around not doing much and men are just out there doing everything and I'm, i just don't think it's a true narrative um and i, I think it betrays I think it betrays the contributions of women, in fact, because they were not doing the exact same work as men. Um, it's viewed as if, oh, okay, only the type of labor and the type of things that men are doing, like we're only going to put a value on that and we're going to try to shove millions, billions of women in that same direction by those same comparison points. Whereas I don't think that's, that doesn't, that's not the reality of the complementary nature that we've had for however many thousands of years of our existence. You and I agree violently. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will add a confounding variable. Okay. So I don't think there's any greater contribution any human being can make to humanity other than have a child and raise it well. Yes. Now I say that as somebody who doesn't have children, but I'm not delusional. I get that that should be the default life path for most people. Mm -hmm. If you are unsure what you should do with your life, I highly encourage you to seriously contemplate having children and raising them well, male or female. Yeah. Just, I've got a whole thing about why I think that's a, almost certainly the wisest path for the largest number of people. Mm -hmm. Always exceptions. Anyway, I hope people consider it. Uh, the confounding variable for women is that I think what is true for men because we don't have to take on the huge birth, nine months of being pregnant. It's a lot. So nine months, then you also are the only one that can lactate. So you're gonna breastfeed. And then by the way, nature had to optimize you for like being way into that shit. So not only are you into it by temperament, meaning you're more into people, you're more in tune with their emotions, you are more emotionally available yourself. The world just kind of narrowed because again, nature doesn't give a shit about anything other than do you have kids that live long enough to have kids? And so we've just been incentivized in, in not incentivized is the wrong one. We, we have been shaped mm. through incentives to be different ways. Yes. And so, I like to word it this way, though. I have no idea how your audience will react. But women, women have, as the sexual gatekeepers, have bred men to be the way that they are. So cool. We're more interested in things. Yes. So now you've got nature hamstringing women. You're, you have your period. It, that's not easy to deal with when you're going through it. Uh, you could be pregnant and have to deal with the children. Uh, you could have kids and have to be dealing with that. Um, hunting, especially if we're talking like a, a pretty big predatory animal is going to require the kind of explosive speed and strength mm -hmm. and direction orientation that men have. Okay. Now millions of years of evolution like that, then you introduce the modern era Yeah. and the confounding variable is, uh, what happens when women get access to birth control? Now all of a sudden they're like, oh, I can opt out of having kids or even having to worry about it for quite some period of time. So now I have more options available to me. Also, you're not fighting for every bit of calorie that you get. So all of a sudden you have time to read and get educated and suddenly you realize, oh my God, I'm into marine biology and I can put off having kids for like 10 or 15 years. So I wanna go pursue marine biology. But that started happening and women were like, 
hang on, I'm not being invited into the workforce. I'm not being respected that this is the choice that I want to make. And so there was a lot of early friction and that created a societal narrative, however untrue, Mm. because now I don't think that narrative makes any fucking sense. Women are doing way better than men on a lot of different metrics. For sure. So, but the narrative is still going, right? We are both the shout and the echo. So this echo is just coming back like crazy. And so again, the reason they put the narrative in is they may have grown up at a time where their mom wanted to work and couldn't, or their mom like couldn't get the kind of job that she wanted because she never got that education because her parents told her, like literally my wife who is in her mid forties, she was told, she's only in her mid forties, mm-hmm. okay? She was born in 79 and she was told in the nineties, you can study whatever you want in college because you're just gonna end up being a mother anyway. Meaning whatever you study doesn't matter, it's a throwaway, you're gonna be a mother. Now mm-hmm. he meant it with reverence, You'll do the greatest thing that any human being could ever do, which is have children. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 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 of course, go study whatever you want. Underwater basket weaving, doesn't matter. (laughs) Because the thing that really matters, the the tremendously beautiful contribution that you will make to your family, to this world, is to have a child. He was not flipping about it. But he literally didn't care what she studied. That's in the 90s. So there are a lot of people that are like, hey, I very much feel alienated from that world where I want to climb the corporate ladder. I look at, I forget the CEO of Pepsi's name, but like, I want to climb the ladder like that. And so now you get storytellers going, oh, cool, I'm going to show all the stories of women being the baddest mm. of the badasses, the smartest, better than men, so that it just, people have that representation of like, yo, you can be this dope. And I get that. So. Uh, this is weird for anybody not watching. I happen to be a white guy, though. I think it is by far the least interesting thing about me. <laughs> but I wrote a comic book where one of the lead characters is a black woman. And I had this woman bring her young black daughter up to me at a comic convention. And the mom burst into tears and was like, I had to thank you uh, because my daughter pointed at her on the comic book and said, she looks like me. Mm-hmm. And we don't see enough of that in comics. And dude, as a white guy, already knowing the culture war shit, I was still like, fuck, that hits me in the heart. Like I was so stoked that that was the reaction. So like, I'll just accept that everybody's got great intentions, but what they have forgotten is you have to tell a good story first. Mm -hmm. And I forget who said it, but like, oh God, Um, he's one of your countrymen. countrymen. He was almost- As in England? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was almost um, 007. Oh God, he's like the suavest dude on planet Earth. Black guy? Yes. Idris Elba. Idris Elba, thank you. Okay, uh, so he said, uh, I'm not a black actor. I'm just an actor, Yeah. right? So they have to just be characters. They can't be female characters. Strong independently, strong independent female. Like it's it's a character. They're gonna be flawed and they're gonna have foibles. In fact, this is why J.K. Rowling, is the greatest living author as far as I can tell. Okay. If somebody can point to somebody better, I'm here for it. But oh my God, you need only read in book five of the Harry Potter series, the, the sequence around Harry's first kiss covers everything about coming to age. It, it is the most jaw-droppingly well-written sequence I've ever read. It is unbelievable. It mm. makes me feel so badly about myself because I cannot write that good. <laughs> it, it is unbelievable but it's all about the flaws. It's all about the things we don't see. That's when we recognize ourselves, that Harry is like completely confused about why Cho is crying during their first kiss, but uh, Harmony understands it and can explain it to him and you realize that's her strength and, oh God. So anyway, when you make these complex characters that are not purely heroic, they're not purely villainous, it's it's unbelievably true Mm. and when we see that kind of depth and truth then you've really got something so anyway these are well-intentioned people that are right that people love to see things that look like themselves that make them feel like they can dream about that but at the same time if it's not a dope character who's completely flawed and that like i should see myself in the portrayal of a black woman because it's a fucking human and there's no universe in which Mm -hmm. i don't have more in common with her then I don't. Of yes. course, there are going to be huge things that we don't overlap on. But 
anyway. I, I'll get off the soapbox. No, no, it's but all like, good, man. <laughs> getting people to understand Passion. that, that you, you have to tell the story well first, and to tell a story well, you have to invite me inside their humanity, mm -hmm. and nobody's perfect. This is what a lot of the um, modern mainstream media is completely missing, because they're so obsessed with these concepts of quote-unquote representation and diversity, and it's become so ideological that they've missed the storytelling part and the actual character building. And I think a lot of it, and maybe this is just because it's so lopsided in terms of like cultural and political beliefs, like it's, it's shifted so far left, that I think there's a lot of assumption on their part that people are way more bigoted than and far less tolerant than they are in reality, mm. right? So they'll create a character who's super, I don't know, they'll make a black female character and they'll make her super obnoxious and unlikable and just kind of take an a-hole male type character and slap a female on top of it and release it and people don't like it and it doesn't sell well and the movie or show or whatever it is doesn't do well and then they're like, see, I told you, you were racist and sexist and so on. It's like, no, it's just, it's just not a good character. Like I've seen my entire life, I was born in the mid 80s and at least throughout the time I've been alive, like I've, I and my friends and people I know, regardless of our backgrounds, ethnicity, whatever it is, we can all, we all feel represented by a dope character. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You, have you, you've probably seen that meme. Uh, have, you, have you seen that meme where it's got the, it's got like the sort of two comic strip panels and um, <laughs> I think it has like a little girl and like it's something, I think it's the Little Mermaid and they're like talking about how there's not like there's not enough representation or whatever. And then there's an image and it's like uh, it's like Goku from Dragon Ball Z. And it's got like all these young boys of like every different race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And they're all like, that's me. <laughs> and I was like, that's literally it. Yeah. Like it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like if you maybe this is something where um, maybe there is a bit of a gender difference here. Like I generally do find that men seem to like I know me personally and a lot of people I know when I think of the concept of representation it's not um oh someone who has to like look like me or share my melanin level or background or whatever it's more like the actual character it's the character and the beliefs and the actions and the personality that makes me feel represented if it's like oh this person uh you know shares these very base level superficial traits but well, I also think the kids that have grown up in the last 20 years, they're going to struggle with it in a way that certainly my generation would not nearly as much. Mm. And because, what was Well, so I grew up in the literal glow of MLK Jr., where mm. it was like, hey, that doesn't matter. That's only skin deep. Like, really judge people by their character. Like, at least where I grew up, man, yeah. people meant it. Yep. And so I, like... I would get down with Blade as fast as I would yep. get down and with Superman. Did. You know and people did. You know what I mean? Did. Like... Mm -hmm. Didn't even think about it. He's badass. Mm -hmm. I want to be like him. And so for male power fantasy, which is like the whole Goku thing, and the I've got a whole, I could get a PhD thesis on why anime and manga have just dominated Completely. Western comics. Completely. Dominated. <laughs> which, by the way, in the hopes that Eric B. July listens to this podcast, I just want to shout him out. Uh, oh, that's my I dude. Know, that, that you know that uh, I think he uh, is is an incredible voice. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating guy. Anyway, and it was in Shout way, out way to the Ripperverse. Um, but uh, it is um, very fascinating what happened with the Japanese. They really understood power fantasies for boys mm. and were able to deliver just pitch perfect, which is why it doesn't matter ethnicity. Kids are all like, yo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's um, it's it's interesting. But I think there's a there's a unique opportunity now in terms of media in general, whether it's entertainment or it's news or it's podcasting or anything else where I think the big mainstream players, I think they are, they're heavily ideologically captured and they have put ideology over quality and storytelling. And as frustrating as that might be for a lot of long-term fans and even for a lot of parents who are you know upset by some of the things that seem, you know, that's going into the material for young people, it's created this increasing opening for someone like yourself or whoever it may be, independent media personalities, independent media companies to come up and be focused on the quality, 
not on trying to like ram a certain very specific way of thinking down people's throats, mm. even if they're literally telling you they, hey, we don't like that. That's too much. And you're just, nope, you're going to take your medicine anyway. So I'm quite fascinated to see over the course of the next few decades how that landscape changes because you can just see the trajectory right now. You can see one rising, you can see this old model falling and mm -hmm. they're just, they're taking so many L's. I find it strange how the level of ideological capture is quite fascinating to me because it's not like, oh, let's just try, let's try these one or two movies. Let's, let's try Ghostbusters and make it all women, right? Like, let's try it, let's do that. And it's not like, okay, we'll try a couple things and it, it doesn't work. It bombs at the box office. You lose millions and millions of dollars. And then they're like, okay, yeah. Even from a pure business perspective, a pure capitalistic perspective, you'd think they'd be like, okay, yeah, that's not working. We can, we can look at the data. We can see what's working. Mm. We can see what's not working. And they're not, they're not adjusting. They're just going down this very strange route where it's like, okay, we're going to just keep losing all of this money on all of these different assets. We're gonna take beloved franchises that have lasted for decades and decades and decades, and we're just gonna race swap, gender swap, whatever swap this beloved character. Mm. People are telling us, no, 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 don't do that. I won't watch the movie if you do that. And they're like, well, you're just a bigot. We're gonna do it anyway. And then it bombs and they're like, see, we told you people were bigots. And it's just happened over and over and over again. And it's quite psychotic to me. I think this is where even some conspiratorial thinking comes because normally you'd just be like, okay, you know, they, they want to make money. But then you're looking at it and you're like, okay, so they're willing to lose money, mm -hmm. significant amounts in order to keep going down this road where people are rejecting it. The customer is rejecting it and you're just still going. It's like, okay, what, what else is at play here? Like this is, doesn't seem sustainable by any normal understanding of business. So I've said a lot there. You can react to that however you... Well, so I have a, a really strong thesis on what's going on. So uh, for anybody familiar with the idea of a deep state, hmm. whatever that word means to you, here's what's actually happening. Whenever you build any organization of significant size, you have to understand one immutable truth. A company is not a nameless, faceless organization. It is simply the aggregate of the individual people, their beliefs and values. And so if over 15, 20 years, you hire everybody that, in fact, if you ever gone to a restaurant and every, in, in America and every employee is Nigerian or Samoan or Irish, whatever, and you're just like, how did that happen that every employee here is from the same country like that? It's because you get one in and they're like, I have a friend, I have a friend, I have a friend. We share values. Mm -hmm. And so they hire people that they like and they hire people that are like them. And so what ends up happening in a company is people start hiring people that have their values. And so if your values are like, imagine for a second, and, and if you grant them uh, that inside they're a beautiful human being, this will actually play out better. We'll get to uh, will to power in a second because that's a real part of this. But first, just assume they're actually a really good person. And they experienced a moment like I experienced with that little girl mm -hmm. at the comic shop, uh, at the comic convention. And her mom comes up in tears, like you really made my daughter's life better. I can't thank you enough for this. This is so cool. And you're like, wow, man, like that really felt good. Like I, I worked so hard in the dark by myself alone for a long time. And then I put this thing out into the world and it really meant something to somebody. I mean, as a creative, it's all you want. And so you're Disney and for 20 years, everybody getting hired, all shares, like they hear that kind of story and they're like, yeah, that's, we wanna make stories like that. Like we don't want stories anymore where the damsel's just in distress all the time. Like I love the stories for what they were and I get where they came from and I understand, but like, let's do something new, let's do something fresh. Like let's really take a female that has agency and owns it but they all start being hired because they're ideologically aligned. Mm -hmm. They have the right values, but they don't know how to tell story well. And so they lose sight of this only works if those characters are fallible. It only works if you're not holding this person up as, as some, like, some great paragon. Harry Potter is flawed, man. And at times he acts like an ass and you get to hear his thoughts. And sometimes you're like, that's a dick thing to think. <laughs> but you recognize yourself in it, right? So you're like, fuck, I've thought dicky things before. And like, I've been an ass to people. And so, whoa, like 
you, you feel like you're in the mud of reality, real life. And so it makes it so much more engaging. So they become there with the best of intentions, but they are ideologically driven, which is what I warn our company. We're ideologically driven. So we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that that can become a vice and not a virtue. Mm -hmm. And so we have to watch out for that. We have to tell a good story first above everything. And so they lose sight of that ideologically driven. They hire other people that are just like them. Now they become the deep state to your, uh, the CEO of the company. Bob Iger is like, what the fuck is happening? He's like, <laughs> you guys know what you're supposed to do. I fired a bunch of you. What is going on? And it's like, but bro, for 20 years, yeah. everybody in your company was hired based on the set of values. And so now, unless you Elon Musk it, you come in and fucking, I'm 85% of you guys are gone yeah. and we're gonna rebuild. They'll just keep pulling in that direction. And the reason I call it the deep state, read a book called uh, JFK and the Unspeakable. It is the most devastating description of what a government actually functions like. And uh, if you really want to chase it down, just in case it's like, well, this is JFK, this is all conspiracy. A, I'm not a conspiracy minded person, but do do a double shot. So JFK and the unspeakable and pair it with a novel called The Wealth of Shadows mm -hmm. about uh, how the U.S. Treasury Department used the financial system to break the back of the German war machine. And then how on the tail of that, they made the US dollar the Bretton Woods Agreement, they made the US dollar the global reserve currency. It's based on a true story with real characters, it's fictionalized, okay. but it's a true story, real characters backed up by tons of documents and all that. Now, one of the guys high up in the US Treasury was a Russian spy, mm. crazy but true. So it's like, when you begin to realize there's spies in the government right now today, I'm not trying to be conspiracy. I'm just like, this is the deep state of anything. Mm -hmm. There are gonna be people in your company that are just pulling in a different direction than you. They have a different set of values. The guy that was trying to work with the Russians because he believed that that's what he had to do to get certain deals done. And if I have to work with the Russians, like that's just what you do to get your deal done. So yeah, did I get paid to give them information? Yes, but did I also get the US dollar turned into the reserve currency? I did. So what are you really mad about? But it's like, you get people pulling in different directions, JFK and the unspeakable. Dude, the, the war machine that Eisenhower warned against was like, yo, we've got this beat Nikki, peace loving hippie guy that just got elected president we can't have that mm. we can't have communism sweep asia we just can't have that not on my watch and so look now i'm deep into conspiracy read the book it is extremely compelling and they're just like that's not the way we see the government going and so they take them out. It's, it's pretty unnerving. So anyway, it's unnerving largely because it fits my worldview of how humans really are. A ton of people with the right intentions, a ton of people that are willing to go pretty far because they believe they're right. And they, hey, I'm doing it for the right reasons. Yes, I'm a Russian spy, but I'm a good Russian spy. So it's like all those things are real and they exist in companies as fast as they exist in governments. How do you tell the difference between someone with bad intentions versus someone with good intentions doing bad things? I don't think it matters. Okay. So, I mean, look, if I'm trying to sentence them to prison, yes, it matters. But in terms of the effect that it has, so this goes back to uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Everything's gonna be hard, the world is working against you. And so you've got people with the best of intentions pulling in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. It's still going to make your company that much harder to run or your government that much harder to run. Uh, but it is, it is true. And you will run up against this at significant scale. It's yeah. what people normally call in business politics. Oh, it's so political here. What they mean is that different people have different agendas. Mm. And like, I'm gonna steal your idea or I'm gonna ice you out of this because you're making me look bad. Like all that stuff. And that's just one flavor. Got it. When you say that your company is ideologically driven and you want to have an ideologically driven competitor to Disney, what is that ideology? Uh, that you can get good at anything. Okay. Okay. That's, that's interesting. And how could that be? What's the shadow of that? What's How could that be misused or... Overshot the, the way that it would I mean. be misused is if the audience feels like I'm preaching to them, okay. they won't be interested. It's just Got not it. cool. Okay. And video games have to be cool. Yes. And movies have to be cool. There just has to be a cool. Has to be fact. enjoyable. Yeah. Has to be fun. Okay. I want to shift gears. You've mentioned her several times. How did you meet your wife? 
So my favorite human of all time. Oh, uh, right. Okay, so I'm going to lose you in the middle here with this story. <laughs> I was a teacher. Okay. Uh, she was my student. It was a school for adults. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to put that all together. Uh, I hit on exactly one student. She became my wife. So i uh, very fortunate. Wait, when, when were you a this is at film after filmmaking? Yeah, school, so I, I graduate from film school and I okay. start teaching film. Got it. While I'm teaching film, she ends up coming in and I was like, huh, <laughs> <laughs> she's pretty interesting. Yeah. Now, the great irony is that I the reason that I made a move on her was I had just gotten out of a relationship with somebody that I thought was a little unstable. And I was like, mm, I, I'm going to die single. This is just not interesting. I don't mm. want to go through drama. And so I said, uh, this is perfect. She is legally obligated to leave the country at the end because it was like short-term school. She was, okay. she was here for three months. So I was like, this is amazing. At the end of this three months, she's legally obligated to leave the school so I can have a fling. Then she leaves. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and uh, then we ended up, I fell for her and uh, we got married. But yeah, that's how we met. I want to know a little bit more about that, that story. Well, so here's the thing, and this is, you put out a tweet, and I think it's really brilliant, yeah. which is that men need to feel powerful and useful. Yes. And the interesting thing is women want to see a guy that's powerful and useful. Mm -hmm. And so my wife, like if you look at it from her perspective, she's come to America, uh, she's in her early 20s, and she meets this older guy who's three years older than her. Yeah, but was... <laughs> hey, I was 24. I was like, ooh. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so she's 21, I'm 24. She comes to study filmmaking. Here's this guy with authority at the front of the class and he's passionate and he loves what he does. And he's teaching things that he really cares about and he's highly verbal. So he's good at teaching, he's good at explaining things. And so she saw me at my best mm. and man, the dynamic of student teacher, like there is a reason that people get in that trouble all the yes. time. And so it, it's, this is one of those things where, dude, I get it. People abuse this kind of stuff and you have to watch out for that and it could be really risky and people can leverage that to take advantage. But there's a reason that you see, uh, you know, if you're watching Game of Thrones, like when does a woman fall for the guy? When he wins in a duel or he stops the bad guy from attacking her village or he slays a dragon or whatever. Like, evolution has hardwired women to look for men like that. Mm -hmm. So when you can be in a situation where a woman can see you at your best and you really are actually unusually good at that thing, yep. whew, then you've really got to play. And so it was literally perfect. I couldn't have asked for more. That's awesome. How did you, um, how did you know she was the one for lack of a better term? Yeah. Okay. So one, just, we hit it off from the first date. It was absolutely insane. But the moment that I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to marry her. I came home from a hard day's work and she was on her hands and knees in front of my couch, scrubbing it clean. And I'd never been taken care of like that. So I was like, Oh my God, she loves me so much that she would wash my couch for me to have nice things. This is unbelievable. And then come to find out, no, she was just disgusted by how dirty it was and she couldn't bear to sit on it another moment. And so it was totally for her. But in that moment, that's how it hit me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to marry this woman. And it was so funny then later telling her that story and she burst out laughing because she was like, <laughs> that was just about you having a filthy couch. Um, but yeah, that was when I knew. That's hilarious. Um, so you guys have been together how long now? 20... We've been together for 23 and a half years, okay. married for 22 in a couple of weeks. Awesome. Because I know there's a lot of people who listen to my podcast and who follow me online who are, it's mostly males, but a lot of females too, and all different ages, but a lot of people are asking these questions. There's a lot of conversations going on right now, particularly online and even on podcasts, just on podcasts, just about dating and mating and marriage and men and women and gender dynamics and all of this stuff. So as a man who has been married for over 20 years, if you were talking to your, if you were talking to your, the version of yourself in your early twenties or mid twenties, and you were going to give advice, cause you said something interesting. You said that you'd essentially written off the idea of getting married and you were just like, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be single forever. And I think that, that thought has crossed through mm. a lot of people's minds <laughs> at some point. And I'm sure there's some people listening right now and that's crossing through their mind, but what would be the advice or any words that you would say to yourself 
let's say 25 years ago in that regard. Okay, so the greatest thing that life has to offer you, mm -hmm. it is not money, it's not accolades, it is a truly shared life with somebody that you love. Mm. There, there isn't anything better coming for you. So even if you wanna say one of the things you wanna share is children, amazing, love it, here for that, totally understand why people call that the peak. Uh, but you wanna be doing that in a stable dyad, I believe. Uh, so you find that partner, they are going to shape you, you are going to shape them. And there is a sense of um, this person removes a lot of the blind spots that I have that adds a layer of safety and potential to your life. And so you're gonna have to get good at relationships, that is a thing. And then I could have shaved a lot of time off my life uh, by saying what your audience will already believe, but this was really sort of eye-opening for me, which is that women's brains work differently. Yes. And if, I, I believe the, the point of a brain is a predictive engine. And so you're constantly trying to map the world. And if when you're with somebody, you think of them as being you with long hair and boobs, you're gonna be <laughs> super fucking confused. And I mean that literally, you're going to be confused. Yeah. They won't make sense. And so you'd be like, why are you acting like this? This doesn't make any sense. And then once you realize, oh my God, she has an entirely different frame of reference, largely based on her biology, but she has an entirely different frame of reference. We see the same thing and walk away with very different meanings, understandings. And so, once you understand that people, two people can witness the same fact and not agree mm -hmm. about what that fact means. And so once I understood, oh my God, like here's a really dumb one. Uh, you just had a long day and you need to say a lot of words about it. Okay, now I get it. When I've had a long day, I don't wanna say a single word about it. Yep. And if I map me onto you, then I'm gonna expect that you want silence when you've had a bad day. but once I go, okay, wait a minute, theory of mind, this person needs to say more words, she needs to process out loud, she needs me to hold space for her, not solve a problem, like she needs to really get this out into the space, get it out of her head, translate it into something that isn't emotional and intuitive so that she can sort of grapple with it. But if I interrupt that process by offering a solution, uh, it's very weird. Or here, this was the single biggest breakthrough for me, estrogen, makes bad emotions feel okay. Mm. Not, it makes bad emotions feel good. It makes having a negative emotion less problemsome. For me, if I'm in a negative emotion, I will do whatever I have to do to get out of that emotion mm. as fast as humanly possible. Mm. I must solve this right now. So when my wife brings me her problem, it makes me feel bad yes. because I love her more than anything in the world. And knowing that she's upset, I'm like, let's solve it because I'm deeply uncomfortable in that, um, that emotion. That emotion gives me the same internal sense as having my hand on a hot stove. Mm. My every impulse is to take my hand off. And she's like, no, 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 but I want you to hold your hand on it. And she's looking at me like I'm out of my mind. Like, what, what are you doing? Put your hand back on the stove. I'm like, what? Like, I know the problem. I know what will relieve the pain. I know how to solve this. Let me just solve it. And so that was such a disconnect. Once I understood, oh, this isn't uncomfortable for mm. you. Oh, okay, cool. So you're trying to process out loud, but you're actually perfectly comfortable in this. You may even be crying, but you're perfectly comfortable crying. You're perfectly comfortable being there. You don't wanna to rush to a solution. And I can actually interrupt whatever this process is by going, oh, do this. Because that's not, it, it literally interrupts the process. And so now you've sort of got the emotions stuck inside you again, and now you're back to, this doesn't feel right, and I, I'm not able to move forward. I'm like, what do you mean you're not able to move forward? Just do the fucking solution. It's not how they work. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I was like, okay, I can't steer by how I feel inside. I have to build theory of mind and go, I'm gonna do what moves us towards our shared goal of helping you feel better about this thing. And that requires me to hold space, be silent or ask the right questions or whatever, but it's required. It's such a fascinating conversation. I'm so intrigued by gender dynamics. I think we're in, I often say that we live in the age of overcorrection. Mm. And I think we've overcorrected on race issues. I think we've overcorrected on gender issues. I think we've overcorrected on many things as it pertains to politics um, and so on and so forth. I think particularly in the last f 10 to 15 years, there's just been this overshot where equality was sought. Equality and tolerance and acceptance and diversity and inclusion, all of these things were sought. And then they've overshot the mark 
to a point where it's created a lot of new problems. And one of the things I find really fascinating in the modern West in particular is this shyness and discomfort and overt political correctness when it comes to a